fellow Seagates, most of you will remember me as Lieutenant Padula of Company D and your welfare officer throughout the 88th Battalion. I have been asked to put on tape the chronology and the history of the 88th CB Battalion so that your friends and relatives and patriots could see part of the work that we did in the South Pacific throughout that Pacific campaign. What you're about to see are actual photographs that were taken by battalion members through the welfare fund, most of which, which was done by Chief Jacobs on film that we bought through the welfare fund. The history of the CBs is a very interesting one. Really, a CB is a soldier in a sailor's uniform with marine training doing civilian work at WPA wages. He was a remarkable kind of a person because actually his training was prior to his coming into the surface. Those 10 or 20 years of practical experience was what the Navy was looking for in a CB battalion. The word CB really stood for Custruimus Batuimus. We build and we can fight. And literally, most of the construction was actually done under fire. You have heard these remarks made by such famous people as General Vandergriff, who said, I don't know what we would have done without the CB. General Holland Smith said, we never would have won the war without the CB. And the famous quote of General MacArthur said, there's only one thing wrong with the CBs, we didn't have enough of them. Actually, the training was begun by Ben Morrell, who was a great friend of Roosevelt, brought about the formation of the CBs under the Civil Engineer Corps of the United States Navy. And the training began at Camp Allen, Camp Perry, Camp Endicott, and later Camp Parks, and finally Wainimi, where most of the CVs who went out in the Pacific left from Port Wainimi. Actually, over 400 bases were built by the CVs, and over 82% of the bases were in the Pacific. I'm about at this time now to begin the story of the 88th Battalion as it began its forward movement, Destination Unknown. In review, what you're really now going to see is what really happened after December 7th, 1941, when by December 1942, recruiting began throughout the entire country and 26 officers and 1,800 men arrived at Camp Endicott and the battalion was formed. What you see here is our leaving Wainimi at Melvin Healy, Chaplain Andros, on the Moormack port on July 3rd, when we left for destination unknown with Cub 9, 500 casuals, and 2,600 men in total on that ship. I might remind you there were over 5,000 gallons of high octane gas below us. Click it on. The weather was good, the seas were calm, men were always on the alert, there were signs and warnings of submarines, and here you see the beginning and the landing at New Caledonia at, Jama at Magenta Bay with Mount Dore in the background. New Caledonia was the French colony and was the pivot of the American defense in the Pacific. And here we are on the Moormack port rapidly but slowly re arriving at Mount Dore, which was, which was to be the new base that we were going to build for Cub 9 and Acorn 7. Here you see barges. 
And here you see equipment. And here you see the men in the barges. We'd anchored in a roadstead about a mile off the beach, and the minute that the ship was unloaded, we then began to unload this equipment from the ship over the side onto pontoon barges and then ferried it to shore for immediate use. This is one of the very secret radar trucks that was used to, for an airplane identification and protection. A very great crew working in 100 degree weather unloading high octane gas. Here are 55 gallon drums of high octane gas coming out of the hole. There you see Chaplain Andrews and me, and here you see Chief Herbert, and here are the drums were lowered over the side. Now we jump from here to Guadalcanal. After we left New Caledonia, the battalion was split up, if you remember, in two groups. One group went up to Doma Cove and got there just before Christmas, and the second group came directly behind it. This was Tassafaranga. This was the basis of the great Japanese attack and the great Japanese battle at Guadalcanal. We landed here, and the first thing we had to do was to take, there is the USS Pinckney that we'd come up on, and here you see what we call the drums pontoons that were put together that were then going to be used to unload the cargo. Please notice the CBs now coming ashore, carrying all of their gear, everything that they own, in a sea bag, and you begin to see very little fat, men are in trim condition, temperature here is about 100 degrees, humidity always in the 90s, 80 to 120 inches of rain. Here you see Melvin Healy, and here you see the men beginning to operate at the base camp. In a minute, watch the way that ramp drops, and watch the way the CBs now came ashore. Everything they own, and a lot that they shouldn't have, was contained in those sea bags. Lieutenant Wilton, one of the live stock that we found. Chief Trump, Red Sargell. You see the ship in the open roadstead? And that was just about a mile and a half from the beach. Here you'll see the pontoon barges now loaded with sea bees with the ramp that had been built. The ramp is dropped on the beach and the men came ashore onto what was known as a copra farm. This was a great copra farm that the Australians had used to raise copra. Here's an interesting shot of the pontoons after they were put together and used for ferrying the cargo. The natives came and were astounded. Those chickens didn't last very long, I assure you. By this time, they had moved all of the female to an island off the beach. But the natives, in their curiosity, came in. This is a good shot of headquarters company. There's the cook and his crew, and here are the natives. Here, great trading took place. Natives wanted t-shirts. CBs wanted souvenirs. The galley was put up. The camp is improved. The mess hall is ready. This is the telephone communication center. This is known as Company Street. The natives again gathered around with great curiosity. That's Frank Freeman on the left, and Lieutenant Stone, who later was killed, on the right. It's Harley Morehouse. Here again are the natives. See how emaciated they really are, and how sickly they are. Nobody could live in that climate. Even a white man could last about a year. After that, he had to be sent back for rehabilitation. 
Morehouse and Freeman. We went out to one of the native camps to bring supplies and to make sure that they remained calm and did not join the Japanese and that they loyally stayed with us. They had a short time before that began, been headhunters. And it was the Jesuits who had Christianized them. And shortly, you're going to see a mass which is conducted by the Jesuits and the natives attended. Here we are talking to the natives in pidgin English and pidgin French. This is about the way they live. They ate on vegetables, fruit, and fish. No refrigeration, of course. We built there the first church. Got it ready for the Christmas services. That, this was the fire department headquarters. Notice the tents that had been built up under the trees. Getting ready for Christmas. This is the way the laundry was done, in a bucket. It's a little entertainment that's being done by our medical crew. So you see, there was some movement, and there was some life, even in the South Pacific. Chief noise coming out of his tent. Good shot at the chief, who's now dead. On the right, you see Jacobs, who took all of these pictures and who was responsible for operating that camera, which we had gotten through the welfare, if you remember, on the sale of stationary and we raised seventeen hundred dollars and that's how these pictures were produced shortly after Christmas matter of fact on December 21 half of the battalion left and went to Treasury also known as Sterling 30 miles from Bougainville eight miles from the great Japanese base 16,000 mile men were to inhabit an island that was exactly 6,800 feet long. Carved out of the wilderness, a gigantic airfield where the B-25s and the fighter elements neutralized Bougainville and neutralized New Guinea. This is the engineering office and headquarters office. This island was all coral. Everything had to be carved out of that coral. And the battalion now was reorganized into plumbing groups, electrical groups, heavy construction, light construction, water groups, specialty groups to do a specialty job. And while they were militarily indoctrinated, functionally they were operating as a construction unit. Here's a group coming out of the pay office. These didn't last very long, that's obvious. This is the post office. This is how the mail was handled. And believe it or not, somehow it found its way even in the wilds of the Pacific. And here is a shot of the camp on the rugged island overlooking the water. It was so hot and so humid that everybody was suffering from what we call Chinese rot. And every three days, the medical department would paint these fellows in a different color paint. Castellani's paint was red, potassium permanganate was purple. Another solution was white, but we could tell what the gold bricks were doing and how long it had been. That's Wasson, on guard. The crew at the galley. Wasson again, ship store. This material was literally dumped into the jungle. There was no other way of doing it. It was covered up. Matthews, Ensign Matthews, a spy officer. And as quickly as we could, we began to try to preserve it. 
shot in the medical office, Chief Spano. These are Lister bags in which water was put in there and allowed to sweat, and the sweating of those bags kept that water reasonably cool. That Dr. Clem was also now dead. This is Yippies climbing these trees. Now, these are gigantic trees that had a tap root. They were not more than six to eight inches in the ground. And they were all right so long as the jungle was there, but when we uncovered the vines, those trees would fall. We had to clear the trees to do the operation, and literally what happened was Yippies would climb up that tree, put a cable, the cable was attached to a bulldozer, the bulldozer then pulled, and the tree fell. Hundreds of them, not one, hundreds of them, in order to complete. That's the B-25 squadron on the way to Rabaul. Getting and carving of a roadway. Now watch the way that tree is pulled and how it falls. There she goes. About eight inches of topsoil was above the coral, and the minute that the topsoil was removed, then the white coral extruded, and that coral could be packed and it was packed. These are D8s that we had. Here's again the good shot showing how that road is being carved out of the jungle. That is a road leading to the airfield. We'll see that in a minute. That's a sheep's foot roller that pulverized the dirt. Here are blades and graders that help grade the area. That's a pan that carried the dirt from one place to another. Now, all of this equipment had to be maintained, had to be repaired, had to be cannibalized to keep it moving, to keep it working. There was no such thing as finding a new piece of equipment or going to the department store. Chief Scott, the good shot of the tractor, good shot of the topsoil and the carl. The road is beginning to open up. And I'm reminded when we first arrived, I talked to one of the chiefs, the, ch the Indians and the natives all lived in caves. And he said, big wind come and white man go. I didn't realize what he meant at the time, but we later found out. Because the minute that the hurricane season came, these trees fell over like matchsticks. Tom Kelly also left us. Here you see some of the repair work that's being done. Welding. Here's some tire work that had to be repaired and cannibalized. This is all in the motor pool. Remember, Warren Officer Raven was in charge here. Here's a forging machine. We had set up lathes, drill presses, punching machines, welding rod machines. There's a list of bag being used, of course. It's a good shot of the motor pool. Shot of Raven. It's cheap. One of our generators. We generate our own electricity, our own power, for communications, and for all work, of course. This is a self contained lubricating truck. Now, here you're beginning to see an inlet. Here, what we did is they even played a place so they could grease the trucks. 
There are welding rods being operated on and the vise. Please notice there's no fat on these boys. More of the motor pool. More of the machine shop. Grinders, lathes, punching machines. Here you see 250 pound bombs that were put on the heart stand. And these were the bombs that were carried obviously by the Air Force. Here you see the base, and this is exactly what you heard and read about with Kennedy. These were the PT boats. They were hidden, as you can see, during the day. And they went out 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, of course, at night. This is a B-25. This is a C-47, a cargo ship. Here, they're toting those bombs from the hard stand to the airplane, where they'll be loaded in the bomb racks and delivered. That's a B-25 being loaded with bombs. These are the fighter planes. Here you can see a B-24 that's been pretty badly shot up. handling live ammunition in 100 degree weather on a hard stand where a refraction of the sun was probably 135 degrees. That's a Vega Ventura, a scouting plane. Here you go with the first airplane landing. SBDs, fighter bomber. This was the air tower that we built, the control tower. Again, a good shot of the B-25s. This is the end of the runway, 6,800 feet. Couldn't go any further. There was a drop off right there, and when you, did, you didn't get up, you went into the drink. That shows one of our planes badly shot up. Another one badly shot up and burned. The road is now finished through the jungle. That's Mike Griffith on the right with his chief. He was then building those housing facilities for the Air Force. They had plywood decks. They had screening, and they were entitled to it. If you saw the way they came in and the condition of those bodies after a flight, they were welcome to everything that they got. conference being held. Jungle is being cleared up. This is a trick photograph. <laughs> that wood was very, very hard. It was unbelievable. After it was knocked down, in order to dispose of it and even drop it in the water, it had to be cut to be handled. Again, this is part of the clearing. Here go Jeffrey again up the tree to put another cable on another tree. In a minute, that will come down. 16,000 men on this island. If a bomb were dropped, it had to hit somebody. And it did. That's a trick shot giving you a perfect idea of how those trees were knocked down and how the taproot scarcely penetrated into that coral. There's a little old, little old bear that found living in the tree. We disturbed him. But he's coming down, and the boys will get him. Jake and Scott having a conference.
There goes the tree again, and you'll notice a taproot. Practically no foundation at all. The problem, of course, was every time you knocked a tree down, we lost camouflage. When we lost camouflage, the Japs could see what we were doing, and they were only 20 miles away. They hardly had gained altitude as they took off. And when the, the vines were removed, then all the protection was gone, and when the winds came, those trees fell even more. And that was one of the things that happened with Dr. Stone and that calamity where he was killed by falling trees. This is what the inlet looked like. That was the Prometheus, the repair ship. This is the Pinckney coming in. That's the repair ship again. And here's a good view now of a company street after it was completed. In the jungle, to be sure, with the vines cleared, some camouflage left, and at least it was habitable at this point. At the far end of our red beach, an office of the country was developed. This is Commander Rowe, Edgar C. Rowe, Gray Eagle, California. Here are the Seabees at play. They built this boat, fixed the sail, and they're having some fun. Chaplain Andrews. This is Ensign McNish going up to take a shower. Let's let you know what the Seabees knew about rowing a boat. They went around in circles. This is the graveyard where Lieutenant Stone and I regret to say those who passed away were put here and later removed and brought back to the States. But the blue water of the Pacific is beyond as you can see. This is a view looking down from Mona. And we have an interesting story about the island of Mona. And this is really treasury, or known as sterling. And here you see Warren Officer Ham and Lieutenant Chapman. What happened here was that the New Zealanders were supposed to put two 90 millimeter guns on the top of that extinct volcano named Mona. And they failed. And at the end of two weeks, the commanding general called Edgar C. Rowe in. And Rowe never said no to anything. He said, sure, we can do it. So he called on Griffith to get a gang together to accomplish this project. Griffith turned it over to me, and I turned it over to Ham, and Ham did the work. So he got together a crew. They went over to the island. The rainy season was on us. It rained five inches every day or every night. The mud was 14 to 16 feet deep. The spiders and snakes were unbelievable. The conditions were intolerable. They would move one foot up and slide back two feet. And yet, that work was accomplished. This is a good thing showing what Japanese planes that had been knocked down by our Air Force, constantly under attack. We had to get those 90 millimeter guns up to keep those Japs high so their bombing wouldn't be as accurate as it was. If you recall at this point, and some Morehouse was also out there, a Japanese came ashore from a submarine and he was literally captured single-handed by our boys. We gave him a citation, and we actually captured a Japanese alive. Everything grew in the jungle, from spiders to snakes to flowers. The men are at work diligently. We got in a big problem with the New Zealanders, and because he and Ham got in a big fight, Ham told him off, ran him off. I supported Ham, 
job was done, we got another commendation. Fifteen commendations to this battalion for outstanding services to the fleet and to the war. They carved the mud, they packed it down, they curved the road, as you can see. They worked day and night, three shifts. We kept Ham and the crew diligently supplied with a high priority. This is a good shot of Commander Rowe's boat, which was launched. There's a sh breaking of the bottle on the bow, the launching of Commander Rowe's first boat, built by our boys. Now this is a great shot showing this LST and LCT coming ashore, dropping the ramp, We are now going to Emeru, which is about one minute and 80 degrees south of the equator. It was the furthest point north that the American forces had advanced, and it was used to, it was used basically at the St. Matthias group to bomb the great island of Truk, where the Japanese base was. And here you can see at the What's Up dock, the dust is flying, the men are coming down in the trucks, everybody's loading up their gear, and everybody's going aboard. It was at this very place when we landed, when the Japanese machine gun was firing at, at a, one of those LSTs, and one of the CBs came off that ramp, raised his blade, drove right at the Japanese, and buried four of them alive. Great act. Patriotism. This is the gangway. Men are going aboard the LST and LCIL in groups, about 225 on each of these, and we're getting ready now to leave Treasury and to go to Emeril, March 27, 1944. With all of this going on, Chief Kuntz and his crowd had biscuits, fed these men, and kept them healthy. The very first day at Amaru, would you believe it, that galley was open and the men were fed. While everybody had sea rations, they literally ate in the galley that day. And here they are lined up at Amaru, very first night, going to the galley. The Marines, the Army, the Air Force were all here at Emeru. B-24, the B-25, the fighter squadron. They wanted an airfield double airfield, 7,500 feet long, to neutralize again Rabaul and to neutralize Truk. Here are the men working on Commander Rowe's second boat. This is to keep the unfriendly away. Camp is rapidly built. Here's a moving picture theater that was set up. Raven and Kelly having a conference over a cup of coffee. Mr. Healy. Company Street is rapidly being formed. Galleys, showers, housing units, communications, rapidly set up, but the men are working all of this time in shifts, as you're going to see, not only on the camps, 
but on the airfield, which is very well documented here. Here are two nurses that flew in to take out the wounded. So if you hear there were women there, it's a lie. That was the naval base. Now you'll notice here the coral. Notice it looks like snow. That's the CB working hard. We woke him up. Once you remove that topsoil, that coral was actually white, looked like snow. Here are the beginning of the building of the Quonset huts, and here is now the beginning of the airfield. It rained so hard, the weather was so bad that they built that with a 5% dihedral, sloped to the center, and drained off to either side. So there were parking stands, hard stands, the airfield, and all the facilities necessary to operate an airfield. And I want to tell you something. In 18 days, a plane landed. That's the tower, the control tower. Chief Jacobs, again, and his crew. We had a 5% slope on that field, right to the center. It was so hot here that if these men touched the side of that bulldozer, they would get burned. At one point, 30% of the entire battalion was in the sick bay being treated for fungus. Dust is flying. Work is going on. Three shifts. Dr. Clem, survey crew. Notice that cut. It almost looks like ice cream, doesn't it? Here's a giant bucket. Here are the trucks being loaded. That hill is being removed, and the coral is being used in another area to fill in. I invite your attention to the men are getting lean. There is no fat. Everybody's lost weight. Nobody's gained any weight. But the work goes on. Company Street now begins to look respectable. The bees are beginning to build specialties, cheap crump, cleaning up a little bit. I'm sorry, this film was overexposed a little bit. It's a great shot of cheap black. Here they're putting up Quonset huts, prefabricated huts that had to just be assembled. And that was used for storage facilities, the medical fences, the hospital, ammunition dump, administration offices. One of the great, really, inventions of the war for prefabrication You notice that most of the time the CBs were naked from the waist up. There was no point in wearing anything. It was too hot. The airfield now is rapidly 
arriving at the point to be used. The huts are going up. The fortification units have been finished. The PT boats have taken their position. And the giant airplanes were being modified so they could fly from Emeru to Truk, which was 800 miles, and back another 800 miles. I made 1,600 miles, plus the time they spent over the target. But without this base, they never would have made it. It was the Seabees who contributed and service the Air Force and the fleet. Again, the jungle had to be cleared. The debris removed. The airfield completed. Equipment had to be maintained, repaired, cannibalized. Spare parts taken from one and used in others. I used to look at amazement and think if anybody had to meet that payroll at the end of the week. Instead of that, it was done out of patriotism, as you know. This is part of the tower, the control tower that's being finished now. The storm came up. The carrier Princeton was off Hamburg Bay. They couldn't land on the carrier because of the storm. There are two SPDs flying. One tried to land in the water and drowned and disappeared. The other one decided instead of that he was going to land whether the airfield was finished or not, and he came in. And in a minute you're going to see what happened. Here is this young man who came in on the SPD blew that plane in, hit the deck, catapulted, went over on his side, about 50 of us ran out, picked him up, and I said, that was a hell of a landing you made, son. He said, any landing that I can walk away from is a good landing. That's General Moore of the Marine Corps. Here's a good shot of some F-4Us, the Corsair fighters. This is General Moore, who's a great friend of Al Am, inspecting the airfield and the progress, but never made any comments or suggestions. He simply came down every morning and looked. And here are grid shots of airplanes now coming in. You'll notice that when they came in, they came in on a 5% slope down and then went up on the other side. And when they took off, obviously, they started downhill and took up on the other side. And you can see the valley right in between that airfield. It was the only airfield in the Pacific made with a slope creating a new use. These are all SPDs, these are fighter bombers. Notice these are pilots, these kids are 18, 19 years old. These are additional shots showing how those planes came in after the bombing runs over Rabaul. At this point, they were neutralizing Rabaul. This is the twin caliber, 30 caliber machine gun on the SPD, Dauntless Diver. They're the air brakes that you just saw. There were two. One was the gunner. There's a plane pretty well shot up. But somehow he made it. That's the important thing. Good shot of that pilot. And of course, the CBs adored the pilots, worshipped them, as a matter of fact. 
and they thought we were old men at age 30. Here are the natives came down to see what was going on. This is a great shot of Commander Rowe and the executive officer, Galatia. He was killed, unfortunately. Now we're getting ready here for a celebration. Admiral Halsey is going to arrive with Bob Hope. And in a minute, you'll see this. And here is one of the 18 cargo ships that I had sent up from Guadalcanal with supplies for our men before we were going to shove off for the Philippines and points north. And here's the cargo coming off. This is a great shot of the airfield, all lined up, waiting for Halsey and Bob Hope. Look at the CBs, see the way they're dressed. Chaplain Andrew. These are all great shots of the activity of this airport, which I said was the furthest point west and north of the American forces at this point of the war. One minute and 40 degrees from the equator, which is equivalent to about 100 miles. And we're pushing north. It's another F4U with the inverted gull wing, as you can see. Another cargo ship, a Vega Ventura. Now the activity is picking up. Everybody's waiting for Halsey. And there he is, standing on the platform. And Admiral Halsey, known as Bull Halsey, the great warrior that he was, looked to the left and then looked to the right. He looked at the army guys with puttees and leggings. And he looked at the CBs unshaven and short pants. And he said, I can see who done the work here and everybody cheered. There were no atheists in foxholes, and here they are at church, and you can see that everybody has religion, and everybody is worshiping, because nobody knew when he was gonna be called. Everybody wanted to be ready. And Chaplain Andrews did a great job in that regard. Here he is. Coming out of the church. Even Commander Rowe came out first, if you can see that. One Sunday, Commander Healy and I went down to the natives and went to Mass and listened to Mass in Pidgin English with a Jesuit serving the Mass. This was the naval base. Another shot of the church. You must remember that these pictures were taken in 1943 and 1944. And if you do your arithmetic, they're over 40 years old, and here they are. Now, we needed a survey party for pictures that had to go back to the War Department and to the Navy Department. And so we boarded a PBY, we call it a Dumbo, a black PBY 5A. And we're now flying over the island in a complete circle, and you'll see Red Beach on the left where we landed. You'll see Green Beach up on top. you see the ammunition dump now here on the right, lower right-hand side. You see the, the Hamburg Bay. You see the camouflage, it's still existing. The Pacific on either side the Marine base, the PT base, and the, the entire island of Amaru, which was the main island of the St. Matthias group that was discovered by the Germans. 
And here we are in the plane with Dr. Stone. And we're photographing. And here is a great shot of that airplane, PBY 5A known as Dumbo. That was the plane that used to come in and snatch the pilots out of the water after they were shot down by the Japanese. Now things are beginning to look up. These are the end of the movies. The battalion from here split up and went to Ulithi, as you know. From Ulithi, they went to Samar and Jinnamak and into the Philippines. And from there, they went home. And God bless the Seabees and all of you who made a legend out of the Seabees. Thank you very much.